So the next presenter is Daniel Xu. Uh, so Daniel, you can share your slides and then just take it away. And we'll have a pause in the middle to ask questions uh, as usual. All right. Uh, thanks a lot. I, you know, uh, thanks the organizers for uh, having our paper on the program. I'm going to talk about um, O-ring production networks, and this is a class with Banu, Cecilia, and uh, Katie Yan. I believe all of them are in the audience, so no, uh, they will be able to address the tough questions in the uh, in the chat box along the way. Um, our project is broadly motivated by uh, the seminal paper of uh, Mike Kramer. Uh, in terms of the O-ring production process, you know, in his work, he conjectured that you know, if there's a certain production process that uh, involve the um, you know multiple tasks, and the value of a firm's output will dramatically uh, decrease if a single task failed. So, as a result, you know, the, for the firms who produce high quality output, they will use uh, skilled workers for all their tasks. And that they will generate within firm clustering of the skilled workers, which could explain a lot of the empirical observation that we see that you know why the firms been paying dramatically different wages, you know, including also the income levels of different countries are also very different, uh, being amplified, you know, by the these kind of through the initial differences and being amplified through this specific channel. If we take the Kramer's conjecture and think about the corollary of that and, and beyond the boundaries of the firms. Then you would imagine, you know, this could also apply in terms of the input market as well as the quality choices of the firms. And in terms of across firms, we could also expect to see the scale intensive firms would trade more and also more often with each other. And in terms of when the firm decide on their quality choices and their skill intensity, it could also depend on the quality and the skill intensity of its uh, input suppliers as well as who they will sell to. Okay, so these kind of inter-firm connections has been, uh, this conjecture has been also, you know, being proposed, you know, for instance, by the work by Eric and with, with Kugler in their paper, they provide descriptive evidence from a single firm perspective and which are actually consistent with these conjectures. Uh, what they show in their paper is that, you know, from a single firm perspective, their input prices and, and output prices are often highly correlated with each other. And in this specific project, we'll actually will extend all these previous effort. We will embed these sources of complementarity in a firm to firm production network explicitly. We're going to document a set of empirical, a novel empirical facts. And we'll also bring those facts into a quantitative model to investigate the role of these complementarity in terms of firms quality upgrading decisions. So to that extent, it was also kind of, I'm very glad that Paco present his paper yesterday because you know set the stage for our work too, because it's also related, despite the fact we don't have distortions in our framework, we, we do have to think about the interconnection of the firm's decisions in terms of technology adoption uh, in this setup. Okay, so uh, just to give you a brief kind of preview of what we're going to show and what's new here, in terms of empirical analysis, we'll, we will be uh, leveraging on this quite unique Turkish manufacturing data, uh, which will tell us all the firm to firm trade based on their VAT records. And above that, we can also merge in all the financial statement data and also the employer employee data so that we know the skill intensity at this firm level. And we'll also kind of lo also look at the custom data so that we can explore some variation in the export market. From the firm network perspective, what we will be documenting here is a relatively new fact, which is a strong positive assortment matching on wages across these firms. And this is happening both on the intensive margin, also on the extensive margin, meaning that you know, high wage firms in this production network tend to match more with high wage firms, but also condition on the match, the high wage firms also spend more on the high wage suppliers, okay? And it, Above and beyond these cross-sectional patterns, we also try to show that, you know, in from the kind of the quality upgrading perspective, the firm's decisions also respond to external shocks. So in terms of the overtime variation, what we'll be leveraging on is a relatively standard shift share regression design, which we leverage on the custom data and showing you that, you know, an increase in the idiosyncratic demand for firms export, in particular, those originated from rich countries will lead to the firm itself to improve its wages, 
you know, and also mostly coming from the firm being hiring new employees who were originally paid pretty well. And on top of that, we also see the firm supplies wages also going up, you know, coming from the supplies wage going up, you know, a lot, a big chunk of that is actually coming from the fact that firm look for new suppliers who on average have higher wages than the existing partnerships, okay? So this is showing that, you know, in terms of when the firm's been upgrading, uh, two things been changing, you know, they are, the quality choice been changing. On the other hand, they're also actively adjusting their supplier network to fit to these changes. That actually motivated two new theoretical elements we're gonna put in into an otherwise relatively standard input output production network model. So first of all, we will be trying to endogenize firms quality choices and based on this quality complementarity in the production process that we are already illustrated from the cross-sectional pattern. And on top of that, we also try to endogenize firms business pattern choices coming from a search and matching model. So, we'll, so we'll, we'll, we'll allow them to adjust their business partners in this production network when certain shocks happen. And we'll, we'll put this model structurally to the data and the, our estimation will match well all the firm's joint wage size and uh, their degree, meaning that number of suppliers and the customer distribution. And we'll also be able to match the novel facts already mentioned in the previous slides in terms of their sorting in the network and also the shift share response to the s market shocks. And the key quantitative takeaway here is that we do find there's a strong quality complementarity in the firm's input and output production network. And they also tend to search towards a business partner in the similar quality segment. And when we compare the results by looking at a common demand shifter coming from abroad to all the firms, these demand shifters serve as like uh, a catalyst for quality upgrading in the equilibrium. So when in the general equilibrium, what we see is a fairly significant quality upgrading process given a 5% actual shock. And these are also, in terms of magnitude, we see that these complementarity generate a non-trivial amplification, just you know, also back to what Paco was talking about yesterday. So what you can see here is that there, these magnitude are around five or six times larger than the case when we don't have these complementarity built into the input output network production process. Okay, so uh, you know there's a the the papers really connected to a, a large literature, uh, you know, including quality and inputs in international trade and uh, and uh, and development. It related to the big literature about the matching among the workers and also between the workers and the firms, and and also you know in terms of the general this fastly growing network literature using firm to firm data. And, and, but you know, so far most of them are still kind of in this uh, setting which has Hicks neutral technology and we're bringing the complementarity into the table and embedding into these, uh, these uh, networks. Okay, um, so before, just without further delay, let me just quickly jump into the descriptive evidence. Um, and the, the first fact that we try to document here is that there's a positive sorting between the buyers and the supplier wages in the production network. Uh, I'm trying to show you here is the, is the simplest version that I can ever present. You know, basically we're going to look at the wages defined by the total amount of wage bill divided by the number of workers. But just rest assured that you know, we will do a lot of robustness checks uh, to control for a lot of the observable and unobservable worker characteristics. Uh, and uh, and you know, if, you're, if, if, if you're curious, I will, I will show you a few additional results there. But just you know, here, this is a very straightforward way to define the wages at the firm level. And in terms of the wage of the suppliers, what we'll be doing is try to weight the, 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 uh, the wage of the suppliers by the firm's purchases from the suppliers. So this is a, a weighted measure about what are the wages of your supplier paid to their workers. We intend to use these wages as a proxy to think about the skill intensity of these manufacturing firms. And when we look at the cross-section using our data, uh, here is the re result we'll, we'll be trying to show here is that how does the supplier's wages correlate it with your own wage in the cross-section by controlling for a set of the firm's specific observables. And also we will be controlling for a few uh, uh, important fixed effect. You know, we'll be trying to control for the location and the industry fixed effect and having a flexible control 
such that we will tease these things out, okay? So what you can see in the data is going to be a fairly significant positive correlation. That's the sorting pattern that I was just motivating. We see a coefficient around 0 0.359. And you know, this is, if you, if even just you look at just non-parametrically, you, you also tend to see a, a very, fairly straightforward upslo upward sloping uh, uh, curve here. Um, and you know, a lot of things could happen. You know, uh, one thing you could you could be wondering is that you know there are other characteristics could also be sorted in this production network. And it might be the firm sales. It could be move and goes you know beyond the uh, the uh, the uh, the wages. So we look at a more systematic uh, uh, analysis about the um, about the um, uh, canonical. Um, Analysis of about these uh, about these uh, uh, sortings based on the other characteristics. You know they do exist, but the um, but generally what what we can show here is that using this canonical uh, correlation analysis, what we show that is that wages often way more important than the other characteristics. For instance, compared with sales, um, the wages canonical coefficient turns out to be usually around like four times to eight times larger. Uh, depending on when you when you were looking at the suppliers or the or the uh, buyer side, okay. So um, and the, the other uh, detailed checks that we did is you know try to think about much finer location than a province. You know in case you know the the supplier and the sellers being kind of located at the same place, and also we even exclude trade partners in the same province and look at only the out of province suppliers. We see very similar patterns here. Okay, so in the Q and A session, you know, if you are curious, you know, we can come back to this. But let me just, you know, for the time limit, let me move on just to say, you know, this is a fairly robust pattern that just keep appearing in our data. In fact, they're not appearing only for the manufacturing, you know, which we'll be using. They are also it's very similar to all the firms, including you know service firms and uh, and 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 the retail firms, you know, you know, you know, in our data. Okay, and then you know back to the idea to think about, you know, what's been driving this positive slope. We could look at the composition of the suppliers, as well as you know, condition on the set of suppliers, whether you are purchasing more or less from each of them, right? So in the composition of suppliers, what we'll be looking at is just a simple average of your suppliers or wages. This is what we call the extensive margin. And on the composition part, this is what we call the intensive margin. In fact, what you can see is that both actually playing a role in terms of the extensive margin, you see around 60% of the experimental power for this uh, baseline coefficient. And on the intensive margin, you see around 40%. So both will be, um, both will be incorporated when we move on to the quantitative analysis of our, uh, of our model. Okay, so this is a cross-section, um, but you know, these are all at the firm level. What about in the aggregate? If we, if we put all these data together, we could create uh, almost like a, a, a wage-based input-output matrices. Okay, so so here, what what I'm showing on this slide is to think about when we aggregate all these set sorting pattern at the individual firm level, what do they show up in the aggregate? So on the column, I'm putting all the buyers' wage quantiles, and on the rows, I'm putting all the all. The, or the, oh, sorry, on the column, I'm putting all the sellers wage quantile and on the, on the rows, I'm putting all the buyers wage quantile. And this is showing you the pooled expenditure data from these different groups, okay? And what you can see here is not surprisingly, no matter which group of the buyer they are, they all prefer the, uh, the inputs coming from the high wage sellers, okay? So these column five all account for a, a big chunk of each buyer's expenditure share. But what's more interesting, consistent with our sorting pattern at the individual firm level, is that when you move up the ladder of the buyer's wages, they spend more and more on the high wage sellers, right? So, so this, uh, this, this column five you know, is much larger than the rest of the column, but on the other hand, you can see you know, it's, itself is also uh, being increasing rapidly, depend on the buyer's uh, wage Okay, so so uh, as you can see here, you know this applies for not only the expenditure, also in terms of business relationships. You know these two patterns are all present in the in the aggregate. Okay, so um, the second fact that I'm going to document here is now based on overtime variations. How does the firm's wage respond 
to a policy demand shock originated from a rich country. That's the, that, that is going to be illuminating in terms of thinking about their cottage choice decisions, okay? So here we're going to create a relatively standard instrument that is now broadly used in the, in the international trade literature uh, to think about uh, idiosyncratic shocks at the individual firm level or at the individual regions, okay? So here we're, we're, we're creating this for each firm in our sample. So what we're doing here is to look at a weight, which is the XCKF. Okay, thinking about all these manufacturing firms in Turkey, they've been producing a whole variety of different sets of uh, products. Okay, uh, they will be exporting to a whole set of countries C. And you know, we will be looking at is that these uh, um, these these are the these are the share of firms F's export of product category K to a specific import country C in the pre period. Okay, and we're trying to use that as uh, as try try to tell us the importance of the of these uh, um, of a of a specific country product pair demand. Okay, then we uh, then we're going to rely on this um, uh, a shift, right? In in terms of you know how does the how does the country C's import of this product K it's been changing over time? Okay, it, it, excluding Turkey. So so think about this as being the the, something that cannot be influenced by the by the supply side. It's mostly coming from the uh, the uh, the uh, demand side. And more importantly, what we're doing here is we will be weighting this uh, shift by the income per capita of this purchasing country. And it turns out that is that is uh, that is very important because you would imagine when Turkey being exporting to uh, Germany, you know, these customer might actually demand disproportionate high quality uh, product compared when Turkey is being exporting to a country with lower income per capita, okay? So, so given the construction of this export shock, we will be thinking about a two-stage regression. So the first stage, what we'll be doing is to looking at the change of the wages at the individual firm level and how does that respond to these export shocks. What you can see here is again, uh, of significant uh, 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 magnitude, which is, can be interpreted as you know if you think about a five percent export shock will be induced around zero point two one percent of the firm's uh, wage increase at its own level, right? And then you know you could potentially use this as an instrument by looking at you know how much of the firm's wage increase translated into the supplier's wage increase, and this is almost can be treated as like an IV. For the uh, for the uh, for the second stage, right? What you can see here is around forty percent of the firms focal firms wage increase translated into its supplier's wage increase. So it's a non-trivial increase generated for its uh, for its uh, uh, suppliers too. I uh, have to emphasize that you know income per capita is important. That's why you know we should interpret these export being quality bias. If you look at unweighted export shocks, they they don't turn out to be very significant. Okay, and then you know. What constitutes the change of this? As I already mentioned, if we if we if if we look at the um, average wage paid by the new suppliers relative to all the suppliers at the base period, uh, a lot of that been coming from the fact that you know these uh, uh, these uh, these changes of the supplier wages been coming from the fact that firms being active adjusting to these new suppliers who's been paying higher wages. Okay, so. So th this is a, this is something what you can identify from the uh, export shock and from the firm's own perspective, that it's attracting a lot of new workers that's being paid higher wages than than the uh, than the other workers at, at the base period. Okay, so um, this is this is going to tell us that you know in terms of experiencing these export shocks, firms are actually actively adjusting both on the on its own quality skill intensity as well as the um, the the uh, uh, suppliers uh, network it's it's been using okay okay so the, and just as a, like just wrapping up as like a final fact to think about uh, these uh, uh, firm networks this is becomes a relatively standard thing to look at you know in, in particular when you look at the number of firms customers these are the out degree and the number of firms supplier these are the in degree and what you can see here is that there's a fairly uh, straightforward uh, log linear log linear relationship that these are strongly increasing 
in firms' own sales. Um, both happening for customers and for the suppliers, the signs are around 0 0.5. And, uh, and you know, the, the log linear relationship also kind of, you know, showing that in these coefficients are strictly smaller than one. So despite the fact that the number of customers and suppliers be increasing your own size, it's way less than uh, proportional. Okay, so bear this in mind because you know later when we go to the model, we can interpret this coefficient into these uh, uh, into the uh, search costs that that the firm will have to incur to actually acquire new relationships. Okay, so these are the end of the empirical facts. I guess I will stand uh, just stop right here and to crack a few questions. And in fact, also you want to revisit some of the patterns. Uh, you know, just uh, just 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 go ahead. So are there uh, questions at this point? I don't see a question on the chat. So I'm, I'm gonna, I'm actually have a question for you. Um, sure. Okay, so you show us that uh, high wage firms tend to uh, buy from high wage suppliers, and then you're gonna write a model kind of to match this fact and others. But so why don't you look at also the other direction? Like do high wage firms sell to high wage customers? Why take this direction and not look at the other ones? Isn't that important also for your model as a moment to, to match? Yeah, in fact, we, we, did, we did look at that too. Uh, in fact, it's, uh, I'm only showing one side because to save some time, but because when, we, when I was showing you this, um, this, uh, this matrix, we can, we, can, we can do that both, for the, uh, both from the perspective of the, of the buyers. We can also flip that to think about the, uh, from the perspective of the sellers. In fact, we, uh, when, we, when we're showing the out of sample fit for the model, uh, there'll, be a, there'll, there'll be two matrices for the, for the buyer, and also be, there'll be two matrices for the, for the, for the seller. The, the similar pattern uh, hold there. Yeah. Of positive assertive matching. Exactly, exactly, yeah. So Ben, ben Faber has a question. Uh, sure. Ben, if you can unmute yourself. Hi, Daniel. Hi, everybody. Um, I, had, I had a question on the trade shock. So if I understood correctly, one of the um, interesting, interesting new findings is that um, if, the, if, the, if the buying firm, the one that's exporting, so if the exporting firm gets a, gets a positive shock from, from like high quality um, Im importers, then the suppliers of that firm um, see adjustments in their wages. So when you run that regression, do you control for the for the potentially direct export exposure of the of the of the of the supplier? Since that may be correlated, that was my. It, this exactly addressing your question. We did a robust check. We control for the direct export shock for the suppliers, and we see this coefficient do not really change. Great, great, thanks. Okay. Um, Daniel, I have a question. Oh, sorry, Steve, I don't know how to paste the question on the oh. journey. But uh, so Daniel, I think with your rich VAT data, can you tell us more about who are these new suppliers? So in particular, are these just better suppliers supplying the existing set of inputs to firms? Or these are maybe, you know, maybe they're just like, now I want to quality upgrade. I can start to purchase mach better machines, advanced machines, which I have not been purchasing before. It's like in the orange theory, I'm adding additional stage in my production, in the production line, rather than just replacing existing Bad suppliers. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great point. I don't know whether Banu wants to chime in here. I think we haven't looked at the uh, uh, we we haven't looked at the horizontal dimension of the of the suppliers in terms of you know, whether they're coming out of the an additional four digit industry. Most of the analysis here we've been focusing on the suppliers' uh, own wage or or uh, uh, quality dimension. You know, we've been we've been we've been focusing on the uh, the the wage as well as you know. If, as long as these are kind of trading firms, we can look at their uh, input prices, but we don't, we haven't paid attention in terms of how much uh, uh, product categories, but, but yeah, th this point is very well taken. Yeah. Thanks. Daniel, I had a question about the cross section. I, sure. I, I thought part of the motivation was that there'd be matching on quality and maybe, um, so I was confused when you said you wanted to potentially control for individual attributes, because I thought you would want to see that the higher skilled workers were matching. So yeah, yeah, basically I'm, I'm, con I'm confused about rents versus composition effects should be good here, not something controlled for. And rents might not be what you want. And it seemed like that was designed to get it rent and not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, totally, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Pete, yeah, the point is totally well taken. That's why we choose this as our uh, baseline. You know, of course there, there'll be like uh, um, the whole, uh, you know, there, 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 
but there, there's also a whole literature of thinking about, you know, the wages might capture a tons of like firm component that, you know, the, the usual suspicious, like, you know, uh, audience would, would, would like to see, you know, that, you know, if, what if you take out the firm component, whether these, uh, uh, whether these residues based on only worker component could also make this fact hold up in the data. That's what I mean. But, you know, I told you, you know, this is the baseline, you know, purely just based on wage, and this is what will be taken to the data. Got it. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, so, so, uh, yeah, I, I think I think you can you can proceed. Okay, excellent. Okay, so uh, now now I'm just trying to uh, introduce the model um, in the in the next twenty minutes. Or so, so the um, so 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 a model setting will be um, generally pretty standard. You know, thinking about thinking about the, the, the manufacturing industry, we have free entry, monopsy competitive with 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 a heterogeneous firms, and we have a, a you know think about also like a, a, a general input output uh, setup. Um, but you know there are there are a few things I want to highlight just to just just to make sure you know what are what are new components we're actually building into this model. The first thing what we're trying to build in is that you know there there's a um, firms will actually um, a draw an uh, initial uh, pair of capability terms. One we, what do we call omega zero, the other one we, what do we call omega one. Okay, and the omega one is something that is going to determine your quality choice. Okay, so so the omega one will be translate the quality choice into the efficiency of the firm. And for those ones who are not good at producing high quality stuff, you know, the omega one draw will be really low, positive and negative, such that it's, it will actually, you know, further drag down your efficiency. So, so this is what we call the compare advantage in high quality. And the omega zero is something what we call the absolute advantage in the sense that it will just simply shift your efficiency up and down condition on your quality choice. Um, this is just mostly um, for quantitative purpose. If you think about for the model essence, we can we can compress the omega zero and just take it out. In the data, things will be uh, trying to match both the distribution of the wage and the sales, and in terms of the joint distribution, we need additional one degree of freedom thinking about the uh, omega zero. But the omega one is really the key thing that's gonna determine the, the, uh, the uh, firm's quality choice, okay? And this omega two is a curvature parameter that makes sure that despite that you have the very favorable omega one draw, your quality choice is always going to be bounded. Okay, and once the firm will be choosing their quality, they will have to make the production decisions. And here, in terms of the inputs, they will have to choose both labor and uh, intermediate inputs. We will be completely for this talk. I'll be I'll be very very abstract on the on the uh, labor side. You know, there's a there's a separate block of model, but we don't have the time to cover that. Just think about it in terms of labor. There's a perfect sorting of the skilled workers into the high quality firms, um, and then you know that will indicate that you know in terms of the earnings of the workers, you know the the high quality firms will be paying higher wages. Okay, and on the input side, I'll be spend more time on. There will be a there, there will be a production function that will make sure that for a firm of higher quality, it will its marginal valuation of high quality inputs will be higher. So we're building some super modularity such that it will give us the intensive margin of matching that we motivated in the empirical facts. Okay, and the third block what we'll be trying to do in here is that as I mentioned as as I motivated, will will allow firm to choose its own business partners. So we have to think about the firm search for buyers and as well as suppliers simultaneously. In this model, more productive firm will post more ads. That will rationalize that why larger firms in our data actually having more trading partners. And these ads will be directed towards your own quality, matching the extension margin of matching. Again, just for today's talk, let me just explain that we will be hardwired this in and give you an exogenous directed probability. But we've already worked out a model and quantify a model that firms can, based on this uh, production function, firm can also endogenously target their ads. And so far we've seen that the results are very robust. So for the sake of time, I'm going to show you a version that this is exogenous for today, okay? All right, so uh, here, are the, this is just the roadmap. And then let me, let me, let me just uh, walk you through some of the key pieces and just uh, backwards. Okay, so first of all, let me just introduce the production function, give you the intensive margin of the sorting, 
Okay, so this is an otherwise fairly stand for fairly, fairly standard input aggregator, just like in yesterday Paco's paper. You know, you can think about firms will be using this composite input in terms of the intermediates by putting all these suppliers uh, output together. Okay, so that this is a pi omega. Uh, in the standard model, you don't have the Q here because this Q is going to be this producer's own output quality. Um, so in, in this model, what we'll be trying to talk about is that it, there's this phi y function, which is govern how a, a, a producer with own quality Q value the quality of its suppliers. And the, the fact that this phi y is going to be supermodular, meaning that if I'm looking at the same two suppliers, Q2, whose Q2 is larger than Q1, uh, the difference of their marginal valuation will be increasing in my own quality. Okay? And that's going to be driven the fact that, you know, uh, uh, you know, in terms of conditional same sales of suppliers, I'll be purchasing more from high quality supplier if I'm, if I'm, if I'm high quality myself. Okay? So this is, the, this is the one very important component in our, in our model that we introduced. And the second thing is obviously will be lead to the next slide is that in typically in the model, this, this set of the suppliers are, are assumed to be everybody, right? So here, you know, because we're gonna take this to the very detailed from to from data, we have to explain the fact that, you know, you are, you are going to only do business with a very small set of firms within this network. So, so now we're going to endogenize this omega to be the set of matched suppliers uh, uh, in the next slide. Okay, so, so here, going to the firm's problem, they will be posting ads V to find customers, and they will be posting ads M to find their suppliers. Uh, when they're posting these ads, they will have to take two things as given. There's this demand shift to DQ, just like in standard models, and there will be also this cost shift to CQ, okay? So these two are equivalent objects, and these are fairly crucial things that I'll come back later to them. So the DQ will summarize the chances for you to be matched up with other buyers and how much they're gonna be purchasing from you. And the fact that the other buyers would prefer different quality suppliers differently would make that D will depend on your own Q, okay? So, and very similarly, CQ will summarize the chances you will bump into the other suppliers. And the fact that you will value those suppliers differently because of your own output quality means that this CQ typically shift to, will, will be a cost shift of coming from the intermediate inputs will be also quality specific, which will be CQ, okay? So, and the V and M will, 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 will actually just giving you this intensive chance that you will be start to match up with on both sides. Okay, so um, when you put these things together and impose the constant markup, the model will be telling you that you'll be trying to uh, post enough ads to optimize uh, your uh, static uh, profit here. Okay, so the prediction of, the, of this will be, will be implying is that the mass of these ads and also the resulting matches will be a log linear function of the total sales of the firm uh, in, consistent with the empirical facts I have just showed you, and the, the uh, coefficient of that mapped straightforwardly into the curvature of the search cost function. Okay, so just to sum up, in terms of the firm's profit and the revenue, it will depend on two things. One is a profit shifter pi q uh, that indirectly depends on the, these two equivalent objects dq and cq, and the other one is your efficiency. Right. So when you look at this, you know, it differs from an otherwise standard think about in you know, the heterogeneous firm trade model like Maddox on two aspects. First of all, the, the, the shifter is quality specific, right? And the second thing is the Z is to the power of gamma times sigma minus one instead of only sigma minus one. Uh, so what, what happened to this gamma? The gamma is really just dependent on the search cost coefficient. You know, gamma is telling us intuitively in our model, the more productive and high quality firms will tend to search more, and then that will just magnify their initial advantage, such that we don't need as dispersed a Z or Q distribution to explain the concentration of sales in our production network, okay? Based on this search and matching product, okay? 
and just to give you a, a bit, uh, since we have a bit more time, just to think about you know how this matching been happening. This is a fairly standard like a, a, a random matching model, but the only thing that's going to happen is that you know when you coming from a specific cardi segment as a firm, you will start to send ads to all the different cardi segments. Okay, and then you know what's what's going on here is that you will be this 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 line thicker, meaning that the ads you send to the neighbor, to, you send to the quality segment closer to your own quality will be stronger. And the other one will be uh, more, more uh, will, will be thinner, meaning that they'll, they'll be less, right? So, so this relationship will be governed by this function 5V. And once you aggregate all these ads together, we can calculate a quality segment specific market tightness and which will govern the probability you will be matched up with your business partnerships in this uh, uh, in this setting. Okay, I don't have time to go into the details here, but just give you a, a brief idea about how these matching will be happening, conditioning on the firm's decisions. Okay, so now finally, once you matched up, and you know that the D Q and C Q gets realized, and you have this pi Q and Z, you can make your optimal quality choice. Right, this is just a simple first order condition. What you are doing is trading off the quality versus your efficiency. Um, and, and the one thing I want to emphasize here is that you know, all these quality choices actually interact through this potentially endogenous and the continuous function uh, DQ and CQ, which is already wired into this uh, uh, profit shift to PiQ. Okay? So then you know, just define the equilibrium in, the, in, in an otherwise standard way, and uh, we, we, can, we can basically close the model. So um, just to sum, sum up, you know, what, what, what coming into the model in terms of this, you know, this, this big matrix I've already showed you, uh, which is quality bias, what, what, tried to, what, what explained the extensive margin, what explained the intensive margin? On the extensive margin, what we have is this, all these 5 e function coming from the director ads. And uh, think about the, the upstream link of a firm itself of quality Q the measure of its own input suppliers of Q1 relative to Q2 will be depending on how much ads these, um, these uh, uh, supplies being sending out, which is summarized by this big V, and also depend on the 5V, which is you know, how much of these ads will land into this specific segment, Q. Okay? And these, these two objects will give us the relative extensive margin. On the relative intensive margin will depend on the price indices, as well as this 5e e function, which we introduce into the production structure. And when you group them together, this gives you the quality specific input output structure, right? Coming from the 5e e ratio, coming from the 5y ratio, and the overall price index in this economy. Okay. Okay, now we're going to just put everything together and try to think about how to take that to the data. The final building block is, you know, it's, I just showed you the closed economy. It's really easy to extend to the open economy. We don't have enough time, but, you know, just think about this as being just a, a, a demand shifter coming from the export market that is quality biased, such that the export will lead to quality upgrading. And we, we'll, we'll be able to just quantify the, 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 the rest of the parameters and, uh, and the thinking about the model identification. Okay. So, so estimation, there, there are a few parameters that we don't, we don't need to uh, directly estimate, you know, including the uh, input shares. This will be coming from aggregate data. Come, these are the manufacturing inputs and there are some service inputs. Um, then I, I, as I already mentioned that the, the elasticity of a number of suppliers with respect to the customer to sales um, will directly give us the search cost parameter coming from our uh, reduced form. Okay, and then you know, so far we, we've been setting a, like a relative standard high value sigma coming from the uh, broad and one standard range, but here we can do some robustness. Okay, so the model parameter we will try to quantify using mass of, of simulated moments coming from, you know, the first three are really key, right? This, this new V will, which will depend, which will give us the, uh, the sorting on the extensive margin, this new Y, which give us this, uh, the super modularity in the production structure of how complementary the quality of the firms are, and this matching efficiency kappa, which kind of give us the magnitude of the number of business partners you can have within this, uh, within this network. And then we're also trying to get the fundamental firm capability when you enter and draw from. These are just the bivariate normal 
uh, coming from this omega zero and omega one, and the curvature term omega two is going to govern the technology choice of the firms. Uh, and this turns out to be also a fairly crucial parameter uh, that we will need to uh, identify. Okay, so briefly about the uh, identification about this model, we're, we're going to use 39 uh, moments. Okay, so in terms of kappa, which is the matching efficiency, we will be just using the number of suppliers and number of customers of the firms in our data, uh, and also spreading them out, you know, thinking about condition on your own wage quantile, what this number will be. Okay, so, 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 so we have a lot of data points that can tell us about it. And, you know, the rest of the parameters, including, you know, how heterogeneous the firms are, uh, we will be trying to match the share of the total network sales and the standard deviation of the sales condition on each wage quantile. And the more importantly, these three are very crucial. Okay, so the new V, what we'll be doing is trying to replicate a version of our sorting regressions, right? We'll be thinking about condition of your own wage quantile. What does the unweighted and the weighted wage of your suppliers? With, so, so these are the eight key moments that are gonna tell us about the new V and new Y. And we're also going to shock the firms in our model using the same shift share IV and we're trying to match the response of the firm uh, in terms of their wages to pin down this omega two. Okay, so remember that you know the omega two is going to tell you you know what's the curvature of this uh, upgrading cost, right? Once you shift the, the demand of the firm, uh, they will be endogenous responding to that, and that will exactly tell us what this omega two will be. Okay, so um, and you know. Our model have no problem fitting, and the estimates have, you know, have, have having no problem fitting all these moments using 11 parameters. And also back to what Cecile was asking me, uh, in terms of these aggregate firm to firm uh, trade moments, you know, we didn't directly target to them. You know, these are the, these are the, in the aggregate, how much expenditure and number of suppliers coming from, from the buyer's perspective, coming from the way, different wage quantiles of different suppliers, right? So on the left-hand side, these are data, on the right-hand side, that's the model. We, we match that almost perfectly. And the same, we can do the same for the seller. The model have no problem matching any of these despite not directly targeting them, okay? Although I hope I have really conveyed the intuition that you know, it's, it's fairly closely tied to our micro sorting patterns, okay? Okay, so um, just to interpret these coefficients a little bit, what, what do we find? What we find here is that when you look at the share of ads, coming from these uh, 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 sellers, if I'm looking at, uh, if, if basically, if I'm comparing the, um, the uh, specific seller, right? And, the, and the coming from the uh, quality, top quality five, Q5, let's say, this is a top quality. And how much of that lands into the lowest quality customer segment, in the lowest quality segment, that's only 9%, right? And in its own quality segment, that's around 62%. So there's a, the, the ad's been spreading out, but the chance you're matching up with your own quality segment is way higher than the other ones. And in terms of intensity margin coming from the production function valuation, uh, again, think about two sellers. Let's ignore the price, but just think about these two sellers, one coming from the highest quality uh, quantile and the other coming from the lowest quality quantile. Not surprisingly, you're gonna prefer the highest quality quantile guy than the lowest quality quantile. But this difference will be six times if you yourself is low quality, but difference will be doubled to be 12 times if you yourself will, will actually high quality, right? So this is giving you a sense about you know, what, how strong the complementarity is in the production structure that, that, that we estimated. Okay, once we get them all together, we are ready to do our final counterfactual is to think about, you know, so far we've been looking at if there was a common demand shift to change about 5% to all the firms, what comes back into this equilibrium uh, uh, structure, right? So I think this is a pretty natural thing to do because you know, remember that when we were looking at the idiosyncratic shock to individual exporters, we see a wage change around 0.1, 0.2% on average in the model and in the shift share regression. So this is without any equilibrium amplification effect, right? So, but you know, when we were looking at this happening to the firms and through this input output connection and the complementarity, we see that these wages 
at the individual firm level for the exporters increased by about uh, around like 2%, or you know, 1.7%. And it's, even for the non-exporters, it will increase by 1%, right? The, the, the fact that it increased by almost five times larger for the non-exporters compared with the uh, idiosyncratic shock case itself is actually interesting. And let me show you a little bit detailed mechanism about what's going on there. Now let's zoom in and focus on the non-exporters in our model. So remember that you know, for, these, for these firms, college choice decision, this pi Q curve is going to be very crucial, okay? So here, what we're doing is to plot this pi Q curves changes. We, we look at the counterfactual versus the baseline. And this is going to be the relative change of this pi Q for the firms at different quality segments, okay? Uh, what you can see here is that for the high quality segment, this pi Q actually went up. For the low quality segment, this, quality, this pi Q went down. So the slope of pi Q get more steeper and that's exactly the reason why you see, even for these non-exporters, they tend to upgrade, right? So, so, but what contribute to that steeper slope? Two things are happening. Let's decompose this into the CQ and DQ, right? Remember, this is no, no more than just like comp comp composition coming from the input side and coming from the demand side. So coming from the input side, what you can see here is that this is going up, meaning that, you know, meaning that we're we are, we are kind of flipping this around. Basically, we're, we're, we're trying to say lower cost is actually good. So, so, so this is contributing to the profitability, okay? So this is getting better for everybody, but despite the fact that the, the high quality uh, uh, firms, non-exporters being benefiting more. The reason is that now the exporters being facing higher quality demand abroad, they were upgrading, right? And then, you know, they expand their size and also increase their search effort. That makes it high quality inputs getting more abundant in domestic market, and that benefits the domestic producers who's been producing high quality, right? So this is coming from the cost side. The demand side is, is more interesting because the demand side is not only basically good for everybody. What you can see here is that while the exporters being expanding, <clears throat> two things happen. First of all, they were of higher quality, so they demand more. And because of the complementarity, these firms, these domestic firms, they were facing higher demand and they will be benefiting, right? But on the other hand, you know, the price indices is going down because the export has been expanding, the standard channels in any of these standard trade models happening that the domestic market gets more competitive. And as a result, you see the lower quality guys actually facing more competition in the upper market and their profitability going down. So combine the demand and the, and, the, and the cost channel, you can see here is that because of this complementarity, you have this, uh, this uh, 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 pi Q term get more steeper, even for non-exporters and increase their upgrading mode. Now let's just uh, wrap up to see, let's contrast for the no complementarity case, right? Let's, so what we did is we, we actually put everything together Look at heterogeneous firms called upgrading, but you know, just take out the, the, these two components, new V and new Y. We recalibrate our model to match all the other natural features of the, uh, of the data. But what we can see here is that that's exactly just similar intuition for the non-exporters, this curve is getting very much flat, okay? So, so the only thing that's happening in, in this non complementarity case, turns out quantitatively is not that different from the fact that only the exporters are responding to these shocks and it's generating very little amplification in the domestic markets, okay? So I hope I can convince you that, you know, to think about this uh, uh, technology adoption and upgrading, card upgrading decision by kind of incorporating this complementarity is very useful. And also we provide empirical evidence for the existence of these channels. So what are the what are the what are the next stage kind of to 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 look at? And from from like a big picture perspective, the American country has traditionally relied on these trade integration as an important pathway for technology adoption. I think our paper hopefully show you that you know even a moderate increase of quality bias in the export bundle could influence domestic produced technology choice. But you know, but this amplification relies on domestic foreign search matching frictions. Which we still model in a relative status way, you know. I think you know this is some policy that could target these areas, could be potentially be fruitful. 
And the other reason to think about policy, we just had a panel yesterday. I think if uh, we also kind of try to explore the fact that if there was some external uh, uh, return to scale in terms of the, the, the kind of the skill intensive production, like, you know, like in uh, Federbaum and like Cecil's work, like in Davis and Dingo, uh, then there's also, you know, there's additional scope for export subsidy. And we're still looking at uh, additional kind of factuals to kind of look more into the quantitative magnitude of those things. Okay, I, I, I guess I would just stop here. So thanks a lot, Daniel, for a great presentation. So now we're gonna open the floor to questions. If you have questions, you can also use the Q&A box and we'll give you uh, the opportunity to ask it. And first off, Chad Jones had a question. So Chad, okay. I think, yeah. Oh, great, thanks. Um, so Daniel, I really enjoyed your framework. I think it's uh, a really nice contribution. I guess in thinking about it, I wanted to encourage you to um, do something that you already mentioned uh, at the start of your presentation, which is kind of merge what you're doing with what Paco was doing yesterday and think about misallocation in your framework. And I guess one of the reasons why it, I, th I think it would be especially interesting is when, when I was looking at this um, you know, misallocation and in an input output structure with some complementarity before, what I found is that I, I was surprised that complementarity ended up in equilibrium having a pretty small effect. And it hinged on how substitution and complementarity interact. And I didn't have a very sophisticated model of substitution, but it seems like you've got a great, nice micro-founded model of substitution. And so this notion that uh, you could submit more ads and search harder, um, you know, just seems great. And so, I, so I really like the fact that, you know, in, in my view, how substitution, you know, it, if one of your suppliers gets screwed up, how easy is it to go find another supplier? That was exactly the key question. And you've got a rich model of that. So I think it'd be great to look at this allocation in this framework and see how it matters. Oh, wait, yeah. Thanks, thanks a lot, Chad. Yeah, it, it, that's exactly one direction. I've, you know, after seeing Paco's work and I've already started talking to my closet, I think this is really an exciting direction to explore. Yeah. So David Atkin had a question. Okay. Um, hi, Daniel. Uh, very nice presentation. Uh, just one thought. It, it seems you, you, your data is super rich, so rich that you actually have pretty detailed data on advertising expenditure by these firms. So, you, you know, you, you can categorize firms in the advertising industry and you know how much is, is transferred to them. Obviously, it's not going to be broken down by what, who your ads are pitching to, but it seems like those are extreme, extremely useful moments that you, you remarkably have data on. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, we, we, we will explore that direction. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Eric, sorry. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Very good. Uh, nice presentation. Um, I, one thing I was wondering about is about sort of crowding in product space, which when you have sort of CES, you don't have a lot of that, right? So, so in a sense, it's easy for everybody to upgrade quality because there's not there's not a lot of crowding in the you know in the, in the quality space, and so you, your model feels a little bit kind of stacked towards encouraging upgrading because you know you're going to have more the more people supplying high quality inputs, and then the, but the messy guys there's no you know there's always market there for them in the you know in producing higher quality stuff, and so I guess I'm wondering I, it's a it would be a different you know framework, but I'm wondering if you have thoughts about how that might change the, the you know predictions of your of your framework. Yeah, thanks, Eric. I, yeah, I think the, um, yeah, indeed, you know, I think there's, um, um, th there, there is some crowding force going on, you know, I have to specify, I have to uh, clarify, you know, that's exactly coming from the, uh, coming from the matching market. Uh, the fact that, you know, because it, we, we have this quality in different segment and the tiniest of the market does depend on, you know, how much, uh, how much ads being thrown into there and uh, 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 it does actually sort of indirect creating some congestions in terms of, you know, uh, there, there, there's some offsetting forces in terms of, you know, it's true that everybody wants, wants, the, wants the high quality stuff, but on the other hand, you know, everyone being uh, throwing a lot of ads there to be matched with, with each other. So, so there's some force that you had on mind there possibly, but yeah, but um, other than that, I do think, you know, it's true that we don't have the CS, you know, <laughs> yeah, just like the CS, the CS, you know, we don't have the, we don't have the standard kind of capacity or, or the other richer forces there, but you know we, we will we will definitely think about it. Yeah. yeah so can I can I pick up that question? Oh sure, yes, yeah. Cecilia. Yeah, you should come in. Yeah. Okay. So Eric, it is true in the model that CS does have a competitive effect, and the price index decreases. So conditional and matching, you would actually sell less because the market becomes even producing higher quality because you um, there's more competition in that market. 
but uh, so the exporters get larger, they have more input suppliers, they get cheaper. And the price index brings that down conditional on the matching. But the probability of matching with a high quality increases so much that the demand goes up there. So we do that, have that. The one thing about crowding that we did some experiments with, and it really matters, is that the exercise that Daniel showed is with perfectly elastic labor supply. If the market for skilled workers gets tighter, then there's really a big discouragement to, if the skill premium gets uh, goes up, a lot of the effects of the model goes out, which I think makes a lot of sense with the Chinese, with the East Asian heavy investments in education. You need that for firms to really upgrade. Yeah. Good, thanks. Uh, Marcel Fashion had a question. Your. Yes, thanks, Daniel. Uh, excellent uh, paper, really interesting. I, I had a question that's motivated by the the first part of your presentation, which is about the the, the correlation between uh, wages and you know across uh, suppliers and. Uh, but we we also know that wage um, is correlated with firm size. So throughout, I was trying to understand um, when you presented the structural model where identification of quality comes from. And uh, you didn't really, I, I didn't get a sense of where the, where the quality is measured directly in your data so that you, you have a, an independent measurement of quality or the quality is just basically proxied by wage rate. Yeah, thanks Marcel, yeah. So just, I think your question has two parts. One is that, you know, you'll be more thinking about uh, this, these exercise when you think about, you know, yeah, wage are also related to size. So what, whether the correlation itself being truly captured the wage correlation or it's also partially determined by size. So I only, I, I think I flashed through these slides really, really quickly at the beginning because I wouldn't worry about time. But you know, this is, a, this is something that, that we, we look a lot into and we often find that you know, when we were doing a cost race between the sales and the wages. By the way, you know, just go directly to talk to uh, address your question. The, there is also a part of saw sorting in sales. It's not as strong as the wages, but there it's there. So uh, we did two things. One is we do a, a horse race, and you know, here we can we were showing that you know based on the fact of the of the wage and sales, uh, the wage often kind of stand out as the most important uh, uh, determinants in terms of sorting. And uh, back to the model part, uh, indeed, I think you were exactly right. And I, sh I should have been more clean. What we did is a raw sorting model of the labor into the um, so, sorry, maybe I'm just flipping through my slides. You know, I should I just say that in words. We, so we had a Roy sorting model of the skilled workers sort into different firms of different quality. That's why, you know, in our model's perspective, quality equals to wages just because, you know, all the perfect sorting of the of the labor force. So, you know, in all the identification, we use the wage as wages as a proxy for quality. Um, we could use different things, you know, back to uh, maybe, you know, you're, you're a little bit more suspicious about you know, whether wage does capture quality. One, one additional exercise we did here, hope to show you, is to, uh, for some of the exporting firms, we see, the, uh, we see their uh, demand shifters, meaning that, you know, we can follow some work in international trade. You know, Eric has been contributed to that also, you know, in terms of like, uh, I'm a candle here we're, here we're basically looking at the, uh, using the export data for these firms, where we've been creating uh, the uh, uh, quality measures based on the demand shifters of these, uh, of these uh, exporters. And we see, and then plot them on, in terms of the wages, as, as well as the average supplier wages, they turns out to be also highly correlated. And uh, uh, yeah, through the model, through the Lancel model, we've been all, been all been using wages and calling that quality, but I, we believe that uh, related to the empirical measure of quality, it's a very highly correlated. Right. Let's see, maybe just correlate a small uh, follow-up question. Yeah. yeah. I was looking for the production function. I couldn't work it out. There's so many moving parts. Um, does quality mechanically generate a larger firm? Because I, I, you know, I was looking at, I was reading a magazine on guitars this morning, and I remember that it reminded me that some of the best guitars are produced by very, very small producers so right. this is that, yeah exactly but, very but that, so 
But is yeah. mechanically in your in your model, do you, do you happen to have a size? No. Um, and, and that's exactly why I, you remember, I motivate to say we need two dimension heterogeneity, which is, you know, right. there's omega zero and omega one. So you okay. could have a very high quality, but you have a very bad draw of omega zero. Right. And that, that will generate the randomness, right? Because, you know, we know that, you know, if we only have omega one, you know, right. in our data, we'll have perfect sorting of wages into the cells. Okay. Uh, which which is far from reality. That's the reason you know why we introduced additional omega zero, that, and and that that will explain that you could have high quality firm but with small size. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Daniel. Unfortunately, there's a few more questions, but we don't have time for them. So I encourage you to maybe do uh, answer them offline. Uh, really sorry about that. Uh, so we are gonna meet again, I think, in thirty minutes. Uh, um, and I mean, I don't know, or maybe you guys can keep on talking. I don't know how that works, but the official, you know, time is over. So thanks, okay. Daniel. All right, thanks a lot, Cecilia. Yeah, I'll be happy to take any question, you know, either by email or, or, or any, any other means. Okay, thanks.